Good evening. Good evening, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to this prayer at the close of the day. It is Thursday. It is the third day of August, year of our Lord, 2023. I do pray this finds you well. I can see the video is going to be bad again tonight. No rhyme or reason. None whatsoever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Tonight, we're stepping out of the daily lectionary. Today, the church celebrates Joanna, Mary, and Salome, who are the myrrh bearers. We'll talk about that in a minute. So we're going to read from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here but is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven, and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and went home marveling at what had happened. And that is the gospel of the Lord. So that is the Easter Sunday, of course. And of course our Lord has not appeared to them yet. That's going to happen very in very sh in short order. Uh, we hear a lot of cross-pollination between the gospel accounts. If you're familiar with the resurrection, you know, John mentions a little detail here, Mark a little detail there, Matthew a detail there. None of them are contradicting each other. They're just telling a story from four different points of view. Matthew and John, of course, were eyewitnesses to most of the events. Uh, Mark, maybe some. Luke, not at all, so he's hearing it. But it's that's fascinating because Luke is telling the same story. And it shows you how carefully the story was handed over case by Peter and Paul to Luke. Now, one of the things we want to point out when we look at this text is one of the things uh, that we struggle with in our culture, did Jesus really rise from the dead? Uh, granted, it's a great miracle and it doesn't happen, but you know, once, it, once, let's say in this way, Jesus certainly raised people from the dead, uh, as did some of the prophets before him as did the apostles after him in his name, both before and after. But the only one to rise from the dead and stay risen is, of course, Christ our Lord. Everybody else died again and, and will await the resurrection when they will rise to the everlasting life, this punishment or, or uh, blessing, eternal life with our Lord. But the detail that's recorded by Luke, Matthew, Mark, and John as well, and again, that overlapping, that, that cross-pollinization, I've mentioned this before, but it's a great apologetics book by Craig Parton. In fact, I mentioned this. Remember, if you want me to order you a copy of this book, let me know uh, uh, these two books. Uh, Craig Parton is one of the authors I mentioned before. He's an attorney uh, and didn't, you know, didn't, didn't come to the faith until later in life. And anyway, his book is called The Defense Never Rests, A Lawyer's Quest for the Gospel. And he makes a point when he looks at the four Gospels as an attorney. He says, you know, when, when, when and he's a very successful trial lawyer, lawyer out of California. He says, when, when everyone tells the exact same story the exact same way, you know they're lying. They've been coached. He says, what the lawyers are looking for, the jury's looking for, with, you know, when we hear the truth, it's people telling the story. Through their own, from their own point of view, in their own way. And you've been around that. You've sat around the table talking about something that happened to the family. 
or something that just happened, you know, something very exciting, uh, and you, uh, you know, somebody chimes in and says, yeah, but th 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 this and this, you know, everybody has their own little perspective they want to they wanna bring. They're all telling the exact same story and all adding to the truth. They don't have four separate truths. There's only one truth. And they're all adding it to it from their own points of view in their own unique ways. And we see that here um, in these gospel records and why there's so much overlap and why they don't all record everything the exact same way. Then, then you know you got a problem on your hands. But anyway, back to these women. Now, again, these little details that tell us about the veracity, the truth of the events, that these are actual historic events. Great miracles, yes. Somebody rising from the dead. Uh, of course, that's a miracle, a one-off. And... and it happened, oh, and they saw it, and they wrote it down. So uh, the interesting things about this little snippet here is they, it's the women who go, and they're, they're carrying the myrrh bearers. So we have Salome, Mary, Joanne, um, and, and Mary, and they are carrying myrrh, which they would go in and, and have the tomb open. And we hear in one of the other records that they're, they're wondering who's going to roll away the tomb from because it's a big stone. Who's going to wave over the, 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 the stone from the mouth of the tomb because it's a big stone. And they would go and take these spices, pounds of them, and tuck them into the death bandages, the cloth, the burial cloths. And that would cut down on the order. See, the graves are above ground. And it was just a very loving thing. Like, we, what do we do when somebody dies? We, we wash their bodies, especially before the days of modern undertakers. You dress them, comb their hair, clean them up, get them ready for burial. You know, for uh, really getting them ready, in a sense, for the resurrection. And anyway, the uh, they, it, you know, we first of all, if you go to some of the other texts, we hear they they can't roll away the stone. It's too big. It's interesting that God sends women to prove the point. So all of a sudden we've lost the arguments about, well, they stole this body. You know, they, they because these women go. These women go. Remember, they all have to leave because the sun goes down. It's dark. And there's a guard set at the tomb. Who's going to roll away the stone? The women go and they find it rolled away. So there's a little tidbit just included in the text to say, hey, you know, this is true. If you were writing a story and wanted it to be, you know, uh, you, you physically believable without a miracle, you wouldn't send the women. You'd send the men, and you'd tell about the men who rolled away the stone. So they find the the, the tomb rolled away, and they see these angelic beings, angels, and I love what the angel says. What are you doing here? In a sense, what are you doing here? What are you looking for? The living where the dead are. Isn't that a great, a great just proclamation of what you know, death has been destroyed? What are you doing here? Why are the living, you know, if you're looking for somebody who's alive, you do not go to a cemetery. And then they're reminded, remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, the Son of Man must, a little Greek word day, it's necessary. He says that over and over again when he predicts his passion. It's necessary. For the Son of Man to die. And then, you know, the rising happens too. Now, that little word necessary, must, we have translated here, that little word brings us face to face with who we are. Why is it necessary if we could just be good enough and earn our way to heaven? Why would that tremendous suffering, the crucifixion, the crown of thorns, the flogging, or the nails in the wrists and in the ankles, why would any of that be, the mocking, the spitting, the slapping, why would any of that be necessary if we could work this out? And he just gives us a few examples, a few guideposts here and there. It's necessary because of who we are. It's very important that pastors preach this way. Otherwise, you end up with a Jesus who is just a life coach and not a savior. One of the things our Lord tries to do, remember very early on in his ministry, he says, it's not the sick, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And you can imagine the wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you're all sick. You're all sick. He's trying to get the Pharisees who are arguing because he's eating with sinners and tax collectors. Uh, he's trying to get them to see they're in the same boat. As he tries to get us, gets us to see that we're in the same boat, that apart from him, we're nothing. And apart from him, we cannot be saved. And that word must again becomes very, very important. That's why we preach the way we do. Our job is not to make you feel good. 
you know, my job isn't to make you feel miserable. Although sometimes, I got to tell you, you probably notice that sometimes in church, and sometimes people will say sweet things to me, like, you okay, Pastor? Yeah, I'm fine. It's the text. Sometimes those texts are so heavy and powerful, and I don't get to choose what I want to preach on and what I don't want to preach. We follow a lectionary, and that locks me in to preaching the things I don't like, that are difficult, that don't make you feel good, and I know they're not going to make you feel good. You know, things we had in the last few weeks that are hard to preach and are hard to think about over the week, and they do. There's no getting around it. They affect you as a pastor. They don't affect you permanently because I'm still a child of the gospel and baptized into Christ. But just that, wow, how, how fallen we are. And, and the darkness of this world, when he says things like, you think I came to bring peace? Ha, 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 you know. I don't come to bring, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. You know, this good news, the gospel, that's what the word means. It's a good, and it's cool to think about it as a verb. You've been good news. The world is so fallen it hates, and you hate it, until he comes into you and makes you his own. Our eyes are open. And we see who we are. We see what he's done. We begin to live as truly free people. So it is necessary. It's necessary because of who we are. Don't empty the cross of its power by telling people, oh, you're just good enough. Or justifying our failure to challenge the people in our life, you know, to say, especially those who have drifted away, you know, like, hey, you, there's only one way because of who you are, because of who I am. We need Christ. You cannot be saved apart from him. And people say, well, I'm a good person. They probably are. But that's by a worldly standard, not by a scriptural standard. And, and if you search their hearts, if you could see their hearts, you'd know they were in the same boat you are. He must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise. And they remember, yes, he said these things. So they go and tell the others uh, behind, that are locked behind closed doors. And, of course, they don't believe him. Who would? You know, don't be harsh on these people. Like, well, you know. He says things to you all the time, right? His word, I can see this as a pastor, I preach to you his word all the time, and, and you either forget it or dismiss it, you know, or just think, ah, that can't be right. You know, uh, these people are no different than you. And again, there's why that we have that little word, necessary, must. Anyway, how hard would it be for us to believe that? If somebody just came in and said, you know, Grandpa's alive. I went to the cemetery to put the flowers on the grave. And to just make sure everything was okay, they got the, the headstone in place, you know, and the tomb is empty. You know, the, the, the coffin was open and there's nothing in it. No one or anything, you know, of course, they had the angels there telling them, why are you looking for the living among the dead? You know, he's not here. Uh, anyway, you know, how hard would that be for us? We'd, we'd be in shock. We'd be like, you know, we'd be probably upset at that person. Like, why are you playing with our emotions? You know, but then Peter goes, John, we know, goes with him. And they find it just as the women say. So the women are also the apostle to the apostles. That's a great title. That's an ancient title for these women. They are the heralds of the resurrection. And they get to go tell the apostles that he has risen. The myrrh bearers we celebrate today. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, bless the church and the pastors, my brothers in office, and myself that you have called to serve her, that we may be faithful and resolve to know nothing among us but Christ and him crucified. Bless our preaching that we pro proclaim always the necessity 
of that cross and God's great love for us in fulfilling that need that we might be, through the blood of Jesus Christ, your holy people. We pray for teachers, deaconesses, and church workers, for my brothers in office and their families, missionaries who are serving throughout the world, uh, proclaiming the gospel in often very dangerous places, that they would be kept safe and their needs be met. We pray for the fruitful and salutary use of the blessed sacrament of Christ's body and blood as we live our daily lives. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are crying out to you for healing, Myron, Dennis, Dave, Dawn, Ardo, Klaus, Donna, Luray, Elena, Cecil, Karen, Jeremy, Marlis, Anita, Dave, Dylan, Jeff, Christy, Brad, Paul, Clint, Beth, Don, Amy, Scott, Ashley, Camden, Jason, John, D, Heather, Bert, Ron, Tom, Dawn, Liberty, Joe, Phil, Katie, Josiah, Bob, Jim, Tom, Eric, Deb, and all who pray out to you. Place your healing hand upon them according to your gracious will, comforting them always with forgiveness of sins and the promise of everlasting life. And we pray for favorable weather, that the crops here locally may bring forth an abundance of fruit and farmers' needs may be met and their families be provided for. Plus those who travel, allow them to reach their destination safely and then to return home to those people they love. All this we ask in the precious name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Visit our dwellings, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body, soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. I don't think I'm going to get through this whole hymn tonight. My voice, you can tell, is a little gravelly. I had uh, back-to-back meetings for the last several hours. So, uh, you watchers and you holy ones, we sing that hymn uh, when we... Uh, often on, on a day we celebrate uh, one of the saints that have gone before us. It's from the church triumphant section of the hymn. Ye watchers and ye holy ones, bright seraphs, cherubim, and thrones, praise the glad strain, hallelujah. Cry out dominions, princedoms, powers, Virtues, archangels, angels, choirs. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. Respond, ye souls, in endless rest. Ye patriarchs and prophets blessed. Alleluia. Alleluia, ye holy twelve, ye martyrs strong, all saints triumphant, raise the song. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. That stands as one and three, there are four all together in that hymn, 670, ye watchers and ye holy ones. My brothers and sisters, I bid you a blessed rest, and by God's grace, we'll see you tomorrow night. Good night.